Second. 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 No one had closed the public portion. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will close the public portion. Uh, at this time, we'll go into committee for the AISA reports. Mr. President, I have a brief report. Yep. So last week, uh, a group of students from Rosalba Park High School visited New York University, which is my job. Uh, so I was lucky enough to receive them uh, in my department talk to them a little bit about uh, what to look for in choosing a college, what, how to succeed in college, and uh, what they might think of for their careers. Uh, it's a really fun time. We spent about 45 minutes talking to them. Uh, and they went and uh, had lunch around the area, and then they went on a tour of the NYU campus uh, while I went to go teach my class. At the end of my class, I met up with the tour group again, and I uh, took them to some of the places on campus that aren't on the tour, so we got to see the other cool sites. Uh, it was a fun time. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to know some of the seniors and juniors a little bit better. And uh, I think they enjoyed knowing that someone who lived in their town is uh, always for uh, I also, um, the uh, rec committee met last week and I've been meaning to tell them about uh, the plans for Kings Street at the Cinderella Center. Uh, of course, they moved the meeting and the last week to the day before. And but I did send that report by email. That is all. Mr. President, I have a quick one. Um, it's on your agenda tonight to uh, approve the technology plan uh, for the next three years or so. Um, being on the uh, technology committee and uh, uh, attending a meeting with our uh, chief of technology, Chris Hyde. Um, I'd just like to commend him on the plan, and I would like to urge the board to, uh, to really uh, pay attention to it. Uh, that's, uh, you know, this is the direction, the direction the world is going in, and some of the things that we would like to do as a board for our kids is going to depend on technology and the infrastructure to run it. Continues to grow each year. 
And in addition to our character education SEL program at Aldean this year, um, is whole school morning meetings, which we hold on the Monday of every week. During whole school meetings, we gather as a school, we review our goals, and we celebrate our accomplishments. As part of um, this program, students can go home with a heart recognition and possibly win lunch with the principal um, when they're recognized for practicing character traits that we emphasize. We kicked off the week of respect this week with an assembly yesterday sponsored by our generous PTO titled The Power of One, where students learn how they have the power to stop bullying if they ever come across it. And Aldi students have signed a pledge or a bullying, excuse me, prevention oath that's on display right now in the front hallway. In other exciting happenings at Aldi, our Gaga Pit is up and running, and you may be able to hear the squeals of delight all across town as the students play. Gaga is a great way for students to get lots of physical exercise while having a lot of fun. We're very proud of our child study team here who once again received a grant for students in our autism program and their families to attend an autism friendly performance on Broadway. This year, they had about 50 tickets for students and families to attend the Lion King. And I'd like to thank our staff members who took a lot of time to apply for this grant and also thank the Board of Ed for providing blessing for this event. Our fifth grade has been visiting the makerspace at the high school where they've been working with high school students on really um, interesting activities and getting a nice tour of the steam wing. They all come back very excited and impressed with what they've seen. Our PTO has also generously donated Osmos devices, which are tech devices that the students have been using in their technology classes. And this provides an opportunity for our students from kindergarten through fifth grade to practice pre-programming and pre-coding skills. So that's been wonderful. In addition, the PTO donated a buddy bench to Aldi, which is now at the playground, and students are using to sit on when they feel like they need a buddy. And I've seen several students go over to someone and, who is sitting there and say, would you like someone to play with? So that's been fantastic. Our fifth grade um, school safety patrol is up and running. And since this is our second year of having safety patrol, the students who were selected had an opportunity in the spring to shadow last year's safety patrol. So they were ready to get going on the first day of school. Our safety patrol assists students in younger grades, kindergarten through second grade, with their arrival and with their dismissal. The Roselle Park Fire Department visited Aldean today, which is always a very popular event here. All of our students in pre-K through second grade learned about fire safety and had a chance to climb on board the fire truck. So thank you to the fire department for their time and dedication. The students all received a fire helmet, which everybody wore on the way home from school today. And now I would like to acknowledge some students who are here tonight for their exemplary performance on the NJSLA exams. The following are fourth grade students and for receiving a score of exceeding expectations in the English language arts portion of the exam, Gracie Booth. And for exceeding expectations in the math portion of the NJSLA, Gracie Booth. Cecilia Calcuegla. <laughs> Siaka Gassima. J. 
James Ludek. And Ashley Naranjo Aravello. And our fifth grade students who exceeded expectations in the English language arts portion of the NJSLA, Ryan Brandyberry. Layla Dury. <laughs> Susan Shaw. <laughs> Victor Solar Castillo. And fifth grade students who exceeded expectations on the math portion of the NJSLA, Vlad Dobry. <laughs> Emma Legaspi. and Giuseppe Spano. Let's give them all a great big round of applause. We're very, very proud of all of them. Thank you. 
2017, 2018, 2019, each level. So the scores at level one over three years, which leads you to the right hand side where the color coding is. First is levels one and two. Basically, with PARC, NJSLA, the lower levels, level one and two, we want to move students out of levels one and two and move them into threes and fours. Passing scores are level four or five on NJSLA. But the second to last column, if it is, if we're moving students out of level one and two, that's where the green, the green numbers are showing that we are decreasing the number of students that are scoring at levels one and two. And the final column, that is combined levels four and five, those are students that are passing NJSLA, that's where we want to see those numbers grow. Um, just one thing, if you look at it quickly, when you're looking at green numbers with a negative in the second to last column, that's because we're decreasing the number of students that are in scoring at level one and two, so bringing those numbers down is positive, whereas levels four and five, we want to see those go up. So the last two columns are really summarizing comparing students at that grade level to the next, the, to that same grade level the following year. So you're comparing here how third graders did over the past three years, which obviously are different students. Is that raw students or percentage points? Percentage. These are all percentages. So as these, the color coding came in, now if you want to look at this across third, fourth, and fifth grade, this is summarizing how students are doing as they're going moving along in grade level. So if you look at it, starting at the top left corner, the three green squares are students scoring at level one and two as a third grader, students, percentage of students scoring at level one and two as a fourth grader, and a fifth grader. And the rest of the slide follows that progression. Here is a summary of what we've included in those slides. So try to make it so that you can really pinpoint what we're looking at. The green is class of 2026, and we're starting with the class of 2026 because it's a three-year analysis, so in order for students to have three years of data to look at, they need to have, be sitting in sixth grade classrooms currently. If they took NJSLA as a third grader, as a fourth grader, and as a fifth grader, and now they're currently in sixth grade. So that's the green boxes, um, and going all the way down to 2021. Along the same lines, this is the map data, the three-year analysis. So, same thing going from left to right, grade level, or for the course, this is comparing students that were in that grade level over three years. If you want to look at it, those same students how they're doing in different grade levels, three colors that are diagonal for any, any subset of students, that shows how they're doing over a three-year period of time. And this is where the data gets a little cumbersome to work with because we obviously we can't start in fifth grade because we need the three years of data to take it, the students take those tests in third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. So we start in sixth grade. We have the, the analysis for the students who are currently in sixth, seventh, and eighth. For the students who are into ninth grade, last year they sat in the eighth grade exam. Some of them took algebra one, some of them took math eight, the NJSLA eight. So the data is had it plugged in and it just it was misrepresented because the students are taking different courses and didn't, didn't add up to doing this three year analysis. But there are other slides that have that data. But that's the reason why this is half as, half as many grade levels as the ELMs. Uh, this is a summary of both of those pop outs that came out in the last slides. This is a summary of, of those side by side language arts on the first two columns, math on the two other ones. This next slide is an analysis of how students are doing the percentage change of students level one and two, what the district trend is in each of the levels over the last three years. So the first column is grouped together with levels one and two. In the center, in all black, there is no color coding, is level three. Level three doesn't really tell you too much because if you're doing a good job of moving students out of levels one and two into three, at the same time moving your students from levels three into level four and five, what's happening in the middle is this really not telling you the story. It's really, really what you want to see is 
are we doing a good job of moving students out of level one and two, and are we doing an equally good job at getting our students to achieve at the highest levels into those levels for more confidence? Same analysis, just looking at trends, comparing the district trend at each of those uh, groups, levels one, two, level three, and level four and five, compared to the state trends uh, during that same time period of three years. And brings us to this is just who is testing. And as you can see in the right hand column, this is the number of students tested in 2009 by grade. 2019, as well as students tested in 2018. Um, as you can see, the numbers fluctuate in some of the grade levels just as we have big classes coming through. And we see minus 25 students in third grade, meaning that this the third grade class last year was significantly smaller than the third grade year prior to. On the mathematics slide, you have a little bit more of a change simply because our students did not test in 11th grade this year which is down at the bottom in the circle. Algebra 2 and geometry is really where those students who were, would be testing in 11th grade would primarily be taking one of those two math assessments, which is where those numbers are so drastically different this year than year. This slide is showing you a comparison of each grade level, of each level on NJSLA compared to the state average. State average, district average compared to the state average for each of the five levels of the NJLS. Same comparison for the mathematics. And that is, those are the complete slides for NJSLA. Um, the three year analysis slides are. They have a lot of information in them, so if you do have any further questions or you want to get a little bit more into the analysis, um, I think in years past I've explained that there's so many different factors that go into it that looking at any single data point is, is really hard to make big judgments on. Um, but there are a lot of trends and a lot of different reports that we've used, and I think um, the slides coming at here after just give a little bit more of a global picture of, of how we can look at this data from different angles making judgments as to where our successes are and where we need to continue with our efforts. Um, one of those areas is the dynamic learning maps, which is just for a, a subset of students. These are students who are typically driven by their IEP, students who are either out of district or in our self-contained programs. Um, last year we had 17 students in grades 3 to 8 take the dynamic learning maps, and science was taken by four students. Dynamic learning maps. If you don't know much about the assessment, it, um, it is used by a consortium of different states. Um, I, I added the link. This is the one link that's not in the presentation that was sent to you earlier. Um, but there is a lot of information about that learning, dynamic learning maps, how it's based on the standards, and how for students who may be significantly uh, cognitively impaired, how it is that they are testing grade level standards and coming up with a score in relation to the grade level standards where they are. Someone who's in 11th grade functioning at a second, third grade level cognitively, it's a very difficult assessment to get a handle on them. And you can think that the dynamic learning maps has done a good a job as you can in such a cumbersome task of assessing how students are doing and such a learning So the next set of slides are subgroup data. Um, in the past, We've been asked about some of the subgroup data. Board members had some particular interest in it. Um, one of the challenges in a small district like Roselle Park is when you are what is called the N number, um, the number of students in any given sub subgroup is less than 20, you legally cannot report about those test scores. Um, because when you have a, a subgroup less than 20, the testing scores tend to get away as students identity privacy issue. Um, however, what we did, this is a prototype, we did look to find some data that we received from Lincoln based on last year's test data that generalized the information to a point that we could, we could share some of that information in the public. Uh, so these, for each language arts, there are three slides and three for math. 
one, and this is a five-year analysis. This goes a little bit further back, just to show how our five main first slide is by race. Uh, five main, main races have been reported on Asian, Black, Hispanic, multiple um, multiple races indicated on the forms, and white students. So across those five groups, down below, I'm sure the data is kind of difficult to read uh, as projected on the screen. But this gives you a pretty accurate snapshot of how the different subgroups are doing on the ELA. Um, again, same five year analysis looking at female, female scores versus male scores throughout the district. And again, this is for all students who tested for ELA from third grade through 10th grade. And the last subgroup slide has proficiency by program. So these are students who are classified in one of five different ways. The first set of groups for the five-year analysis is students who are on free and reduced lunch. The second is students who are identified as gifted, gifted and talented program. Um, section 504, which uh, students who are operating under 504 for medical needs. Um, LEP, or students who are identified as part of our ESL program. Special education, obviously if they have an IEP, and our general ed students. Five years to go through the So, as I said, there's three, three different slides one by subgroups for race, one by gender, and one by uh, program for the classifications. And the next three slides are the same data, um, but the mathematics side. First one, proficiency by, by race, proficiency by broken down by gender, and proficiency by program. The last set of data that uh, you know, um, Ms. Bodick and I had a difficult time of figuring out how to present this to, to, to do something meaningful for access testing. Um, simply because access testing is, um, your goal is you don't want to see students scoring at the higher levels and remain in your ESL program. Um, access testing is students take it from kindergarten to 12th grade if they're participating in the ESL program, and this score is calculated on a scale of one to six. Um, to put that in perspective, uh, students who are known are they classified as being port of entry students, meaning that they have entered the United States within the last 12 months and speak a uh, home language other than English. They are classified as port of entry students. Port of entry students, typically, you'd expect that to score at a level of one on the access test. So as a student comes into our school system, they start to learn the language, we give them support. You'd like to see their scores go from one and eventually get over that hump into levels four, five, and six. Um, the data is broken down over three or three years before access testing, and I broke it down into levels one to three and levels four, five, and six. The reason why we broke it there is the state of New Jersey recommends if students reach a level 4.5 on access testing, they should be exited from the program. Um, so basically any student that is three or higher, we're looking at their data, looking at the rest of their assessments, how they're functioning in schools, to see if they're a candidate to be exited from the program. Um, you rarely exit students at level three, um, but that's when you start taking a look at their data to see if you can then exit it from the program and then support them through the basic skills program. Um, again, that's when students reach that level 4.5 or higher, you're looking to exit the student. So um, for this, compared to the previous slides, you don't want to see your numbers at levels 4, 5, and 6 continue to grow because as soon as students are reaching those levels of testing, you're looking to get them out of the program and not provide um, ESL support when they no longer need it. And to wrap up, just one, one quick slide just to kind of uh, give some indication of how we're using this testing data. And this is, these are decisions that were made um, mostly mid-year last year into the summer to prepare for this year. Um, just three examples of how we're using the testing data that we're getting. And a lot of the data that we're um, getting from Lincoln, using that Lincoln assessment software to get a get better handle of how our students are performing. Um, at the high school, they offer math problem solving, which the main criteria for that class, or one of the criteria for the class, is that if students are scoring below 740 on the NJSLA, they get an extra math class. So instead of just having one math class, they have a second math class, math problem solving, to help them 
get the skills they need to get past that exam so that they can, they can have that checked off as their exit criteria for graduation from high school. Last year at the middle school, Ms. Uh, Ms. Goes was, took a good look at all of the scheduling and the student data, and when they looked at the math course offerings, we offered three levels of math. We had standard math, advanced math, and honors math. And with an analysis of the student data, it didn't show that it was justified to have a third level of math, that we were better served by having two levels of math, standard and honors, and eliminating that third section to benefit the school as a whole. Um, so that was implemented for 1920 based on uh, principal's analysis of the scores that came in. And at the elementary schools, this is something that's evolved that you, the board has been very supportive and we've had energized math for quite some time and the teachers really appreciate that. It allows them to get a little bit further in the curriculum before uh, testing. Um, but it's something that now with having such detailed standard-based data from Lincoln, the form A, B, and C tests that are taken, that the energized program is a lot more individualized for students so that we can really pick what the content is uh, specific to the students in the class so that we can target students' needs um, using that after-school program that we've had for some time. Um, and in talking to teachers, they said, anything we say about energized math, make sure you say thank you again for the support to continue this program because we know it, it is a supplemental program that ultimately needs funding and having that support from the board to offer that is something that our teachers very much appreciate. So, how's that for time? Right. Um, I'm sure, I know I wanted to make sure we got through everything and just make sure you had all the information. Um, I know there's the slides, there's quite a bit of information there that makes sense of it. So if you have any questions about slides or data to look from a different direction, I'm more than happy to. Can I ask you a quick question, Mr. Sapo? Um, yeah. Concerning energized math for the elementary school, so. Now, what children are targeted for that program? And, I mean, compared to the level, what is it, level one, two, three? All, all students are, being, are asked to participate. I think the, what the teachers do is fine tune their plans when they know who is planning to attend and who's going to make it. Better. But it is, it is offered to all students. students. Okay. Okay. And, um, and I'm looking at the scores, and I'm looking at a big chunk of the, the level three. And, you know, with the LA, it's like, you know, some of them are 40%, 30%. I mean, they're, they're, they're approaching it. I would love them to meet expectations. So do we have plans in place now or, or maybe in the future to target that, not only just LA, but also in math? Because that's a big side of the game. We can move that population. Of course, we pay attention to the ones in the twos. But that population, I mean, are there plans in place to help move them to get to meeting it? Yeah, um, I think one thing that, uh, that we, we pay close attention to, um, link it data that we're taking the forms A, B, and C, is another column of uh, classification called the bubble group, which are students that are in the upper 10% of level three or the lower 10% of level four testing. So it captures some students that are meeting expectations, but it might be one question or two questions that they can very easily fall back into level three. Right. So those students are one half of the bubble group and the other half are those students who are one or two questions away from getting over that hump. Um, the point is, it's something that we've discussed numerous times over the last couple of years um, about really pinpointing and, and being a little bit more deliberate to target specific student needs with the Energize program. The problem is scheduling. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, to figure out working on sports schedules and CCD schedules and everything else, it, it's course um, and all those things it becomes quite a challenge. We've, we've tried a couple of teachers from different schools that implored us to consider letting them have a little bit more input to make the dates and figure out the dates that work in their class so they, they would, instead of it being all of third, fourth, and fifth trying to figure that out, that individual teachers could work their schedule to meet their students' needs. Sure. Um, it's just something that, for different reasons, whether it be admin transition, after school, whether that it's something that we've never gone that next step and, and done it differently. Um, I think another factor that, that goes in is that we've had support for this for so long. What if it doesn't go well with these big changes? We don't want to lose the ability to offer it. So I think there's some trepidation right. losing something that's working in order to make it better. Right, but those bubble kids, some of them are probably one or two questions away. But that's exactly Absolutely. right. And I think as the trend continues to be more for personalized learning, 
in the classroom. We're looking closely at the Lincoln data and giving that to the teachers. So when there is small group instruction in the classroom, those students can target that, you know, the areas where they're missing those, the global students that, that right. uh, Mrs. Salvin is talking about. So, you know, not only those additional programs like Energize, but what is being done in the classroom to look at the data as well. Sure. You know, take a look at that data profile that we give them. You know, and if those students are the global students, those are the students that are targeting right here. Another aspect of what we're doing, a lot of the programs we subscribe to, I'm, I'm sure as a teacher you're aware, a lot there, they're very targeted now. You can really, students take a pre assessment and then the program automatically differentiates instruction to target what their needs are. Um, we're also really, we use Freckle, we use Reflex Math, we're using a to Z, reading to Z with students. We're constantly trying to get more targeted with how we're using those and make better decisions so that we're using, basically investing that money in the programs that feel the needs that we have. And Link is how many years old now with us? This is the second year. Second okay. Year. Um, we piloted it at the end, end of 2017, 18. Um, and instant returns were wow, this is pretty, this is impressive. This is information that we've never had, and now we have it in nine different ways. I think most of last year we spent trying to understand what we were getting from the data, and now this year we're trying to make better choices of, well, we have these 10 pieces of data, we use six. What happened with these four? Are they not we, Is it worth the teacher's time to enter that information so that we can do it, or should we find something else that we should be analyzing? better choices of. So I think the getting used to the system and the idea of data data driven instruction to the level that we're doing it now is, is year one. And now K3 is making better decisions about what that data is telling us and trying to input data in a way so that we we know what we're getting out of it. So I think year one we put a lot of stuff in and some of it we came out of what do we can do with this thing? Um, but I think this year we do a much better job of like, really understanding So, uh, th first of all, thank you for uh, doing this enhanced version of the presentation. I appreciate that there was extra work put into it. And also that you had to step in at the last minute for it's going back to the uh, Yeah, it got more complex. <laughs> <laughs> Such things happen. Uh, we're, we're in good hands at this voting. Yeah. I'm anxiously waiting for her to come back. She's, she's really brought a different perspective to the district in the last year and a half. Well, I sent her an email today and she said she would get back. The autoresponder said she's going to get back to me in February. <laughs> um, as an eager student, I always loved the days when I got my testing reports back, the day I got my report cards. And so, you know, this is our report card, this district's report card, and I don't think we need to uh, rush through it. So, um, of all the slides that you showed us, of all of the numbers, which are the, the ones you're most proud of, and which are the ones that concern you the most? Um, I think the general snapshot of just seeing that we're, we're, we're gaining and we're making and our efforts are paying off, just in the general summary that we're beating the state average by in you know, some places just a little bit and in some places quite, quite a bit. Um, I think that, that's something that I look at and say, okay, so generally we're doing a good job. Um, I think I've, I've said something this late last year, but when it comes to the rest of the data, I, I tend to look at it through, well, what is this telling me about Mrs. Scully's fifth grade students at Aline, let me verify them. This is what I think I'm getting from here, what do you think? And I think every time that I've made an assumption from what I'm looking at data-wise, there's been a lot more to it in conversation about it and, and working through what the students are doing, what the struggles are, and what she could use in the building to make a difference the way, I'm, the way that I'm insinuating from that call. I think many times you pull over and you think you're seeing one thing and it's is it class size? Is it you know, the teacher support? Is it you know, what is it? And then you figure out that well, if you want that, help me do, and we'll make it happen. I think that you know, using Mrs. Scully as an example, I think in three years, four years, that she's been a, it's, it's very receptive to having that conversation, to taking data analysis and figuring out a way. Like, okay, I get that the central office, Ms. Kodik, Ms. Salvo, Ms. Rio, they're all seeing this. I agree. What can we do here about being differently moving forward? And I think we spoke about class meetings and um, you know, 
getting everyone together on Monday to talk about goals, and we've done a lot more with making students aware of, of the data that we're looking at. And I think some teachers had a real struggle with something that I championed just recently at the elementary level, which was putting this data in students' hands and helping them see it as positive. And I think that it went really, really positively that students saw scores with formative assessment. Their scores were expected to be somewhere between 25 and 40% for ELA and AI. And they followed the lead, the teacher presenting it, and said, look, this is, this is the whole year we're testing. Let's just see the areas that you think you can do better on. Let's set some realistic goals. And the student said, OK, so, oh, so the 25 isn't bad. Oh, I did well here, but I want to be doing better here. And the technology teachers led them through an analysis of, of the reports, that the individualized reports of their uh, results. And across the board, all three teachers who were asked to do this for all the uh, classes that they worked with came back with nothing but positive saying, it really got into it. They were really excited to see this. And I think it, it gave meaning to when they when they were taking these limited assessments. So what are some realistic goals for us as the district? I think across the board, we're, we're in the in the process of trying to figure out what are those key point goals that look like for the rest of the year. Um, I think you know, if you look carefully at um, you know, our read to read, I think in almost every area with the exception of one grade level that we went up last year with a full year of implementation with it. I think that we're looking at gains across the board is what the hope is. Um, I don't want to say one grade is over another, but um, I think we're doing a lot to, to impact what's happening between fifth and sixth grade and eighth and ninth grade. Um, and if you look at the state data and you see that students across the board, their lowest score is in sixth grade, and the students are leaving middle school and high school, there's another drop there. Our, our drop is even more, more pronounced at the state level, and we're doing a lot to try to combat that and do things so that that transition is not as big of a jump for our students as, as it is kind of One of the things that Ms. Cowles and I were just talking about is we're, we're doing literacy adoption. We in P2 last, uh, this year, September, and the next, traditionally, the next group we look at is a third of the fifth um, grade. But I think it's mandated that this is this is not the way we're doing it. We're either going to transition out of the program from third and fourth grade, so it's handled within each elementary school, or you know, bring the program through fifth grade into sixth, and it all gets handled within one building at the middle school, so we'll transition out of the program into a different set of resources in sixth grade when the teachers can talk about that. It's, you're switching classes, you're switching for classes, we're a brand new building, brand new set of features, brand new principal, brand new start time. They don't need to open a book or you know, log into a program and see things that are completely different because they went from fifth to sixth grade at the same time. Hopefully they can go into middle school and all those other changes take place and see some resources that look familiar and let that change happen instead of they are set in middle school. Same thing. Quite a few, I don't know the numbers off the 
seconds. At this time, we'll move on to the consent agenda under personnel. One, degree changes. Two, staff appointments. Three, change of assignment. Yes. Four, staff resignation. Staff retirement. Six, district substitutes. I'm not going to go through it. What are we doing? That's why I don't like it. Can I get the 16 and then go to the next one? Go where it was. Seven additional lunch uh, property personnel. Eight additional breakfast property personnel. Nine additional sections. Ten maternity leave of absence requests. Eleven federal program salary. Allocations for 2019-2020, 12 salary adjustments, 13 additional high school extracurricular proctors 2019-2020, 14 middle school extracurricular volunteer advisors 2019-2020, 15 sick day bank, uh, 15, 16 disability leave of absence. Then we have an agenda for the agenda. Uh, I guess 17. Okay, and the agenda, uh, we're going to items uh, one through three, staff appointments, two, staff resignation, and uh, three, affirmative action policy. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any comments, discussions? Yeah, Mr. Uh, President, just on uh, number 16, we wish uh, Mr. McHale um, good luck. We hope to see him soon. Wish him well in his family. Okay. Anyone else? Hearing no roll call, please. Vice President Signorello. Yes. Ms. Carlson. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mr. Lyman. Yes. Mr. Cloud Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Yes. Next on the agenda is an education 17 through 20. 17 education programs, 18 workshop attendance requests, 19 educational trip requests, and 20 harassment and intimidation bullying incidents. Do I have a motion? Make a motion. Not a second. Any discussion? Hearing no roll call, please. Vice President Cicarello. Yes. Ms. Carlstrom. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mr. Lime Yes. Ms. McCombino. Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Ms. Powers. Yes. President Charm. Yes. On roll call, motion carried. Thank you. Next is business, items 21 through 27. 21, approval of bills. 22, approval of minutes. 23, donation acceptance. 24, Comprehensive Maintenance Plan, 2019-2020. 25, te technically, te Technology Plan, 2019-2022. 26, Use of Buildings and Grounds. And 27 is Scale Check Cancellation. That's the first time I've seen that. So, we have a motion. So moved. We have a second. Second. Any comments? Other than the scale check cancellation, um, I was explaining what that is, that the outstanding checks that have been, um, as some of these can see since April. So um, this, all this is is just canceling out that check and then re rewriting new checks to whoever this person did. Who did it? Yes, yeah. and, and then it, and it was 4-18-2016. So good catch. But we still have to pay for it, but these are things that we have to outstanding and change. Okay, and any, anyone else? Hearing none, roll call please. Vice President Signorella. Yes. Ms. Carlstrom. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mr. Lyman. Yes. Ms. McCockato. Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Ms. Powers. Yes. President Conn. Yes. On roll call, Mr. Perry. 
Okay, next on the agenda, continuing business, do we have any? Do we have any new business? Okay, uh, now I'm on the, the second public portion. Um, <laughs> I'll open up the second public portion. To anyone wishing to speak, please come forward, state your name and address, and you can speak on any subject you like for three minutes. <laughs> or less. <laughs> Seeing none, I will close the second public portion. Uh, if there's no other comments or anything, um, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Thank you. Good night, everyone.